All right, and welcome to those of you who are joining us on YouTube now as well. On the TCF side of things, I wanna thank Itasca Bank for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors like Itasca Bank help us to keep these webinars free for everybody. Contact me for more information on sponsoring. If you have a business who would be interested in sponsoring or you know someone who would be, let me know. You can also help us to keep these webinars free. At the end of the webinar, you're gonna be taken to a page with a whole bunch of resources, all different things you might be interested in like our native plant guide and so much more, including our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I encourage you to donate to help keep TCF going because we do all kinds of really cool stuff besides just webinars. You can also check that box to become a member and then you can enjoy our variety of members only stuff such as the hikes we had earlier this summer. So those of you who have been joining us all throughout the last year know we have been doing them every week. Well, with everybody going back to work and, and including me, uh, it's getting to be a little difficult to continue doing them every week. So we're gonna be doing them once a month on the first Wednesday of the month. Now it's seven o'clock. So our next webinar will be September 1st at 7 p.m. And you guys are in for a treat. We're going to do our garden refresh revisited. So if you remember earlier in the year, we had a presentation by Jan and Nancy who talked about redoing the gardens, the landscaping beds that we have around our cloud house at the McDonald farm. They are coming back to let everybody know how it's going. They spent the summer getting the plants, planting them, getting them watered in, and they're gonna talk all about the lessons learned, um, how it's going, showing lots of pictures. So it's gonna be great. So make sure you join us on September 1st, 7 p.m. for our Garden Refresh Revisited. All right. So before I start sharing, I wanted to share some friends with you. So we're talking about monarchs tonight and there are many people out there, many more than I ever knew, who like to raise monarchs indoors. And that just means finding them, bringing them in, kind of giving them a little bit of a head start and using them for educational purposes like we do. And then once they emerge as butterflies, letting them go to go out and do their thing, not keeping them as pets or anything like that, but just helping to give them a head start because their survival rates in the wild are so low. Just naturally, they have a lot of predators, things like that. So we use them for educational purposes. So I have brought some with us. And I have to apologize for the quality of my camera. If it was better, you know, you'd be able to see it a little bit better, but for now, here we go. Oh, we're gonna get two friends here. All right, so here we go. We have, you can see this is a monarch caterpillar. This is a fourth, I believe, instar. I always have trouble telling the instars apart. I'll show you what that means later, but you can see, this guy here is getting really close to making the chrysalis and then becoming a butterfly. So you can see, and then there's a smaller one over on this side. I, I'm gonna guess this one's a third in star probably. Um, so you can see the difference in size. So you've got the ones that are almost ready to go here. This one's probably got about another week or so before he or she will make their chrysalis. All right, put them back in there. And speaking of chrysalis, we have one right there. My camera focus for a minute, if it's going to. You can see them hanging up there. I've got better pictures for you later on, but you can see we have one ready to go. You can see that silk button at the top there, that white part right there um, at the base of the cremaster, it's called, that little stem that holds on to the top there. That white part there is almost like spider silk. And that's what they use. They sort of, they just produce that silk naturally. And they use that to sort of hold onto. It's almost like Velcro. If you look at, at a really macro level shot, um, you can see there's little hooks on the foot that's holding, um, that's holding it to the, that silk button. They're, they're little hooks just like Velcro. So it's really cool. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Here we go. All right. And so we are talking Magnificent Monarchs today. And that's my contact information there. If you received an email 
when you receive the email from Zoom about today's webinar, that's my contact information, my email address. So if you have any questions at the end of this, please feel free to drop me an email. So um, I'm gonna give a little bit of background on the Conservation Foundation. I don't always do this, but because I figure we may have some new folks joining us tonight, I will. So this is our mission at the Conservation Foundation. We're looking to improve the health of our communities. And when we say communities, we don't just mean the plants and animals, but we mean the people that are part of our communities as well. So we protect land, we protect water, and that's what we're doing. We've been doing it now since 1972, so almost 50 years now. So next year will be our 50th anniversary, and I'm sure there will be some awesome things planned for that. All the little dots on this map show land that we have helped to preserve over 35,000 acres, 200 parcels in seven different counties across Illinois. So um, th this is our impact and we're very proud of that. All right, little quiz, we're gonna start off here. Monarch or mimic? Take a look at the pictures here and see if you can figure out which are the monarchs here. I will give you a clue. There are three different types of butterflies two of each. Think you know which ones they are? All right, here we go. All right, so you see we got the monarch in the upper left and lower right. In the upper right and center bottom, that's a viceroy. You can tell viceroys because they have that sort of horizontal stripe across those veins in their wings. And then we also have the queen butterfly, which is, um, it's in the same genus as monarchs, but they're actually not found here in the Chicago region. If you are like St. Louis and South, you might have a chance to see one of those, but those aren't here in the Chicago region, even though they are in that, um, Danaeus is the, um, the genus, but it's just a different species. And it, so it's interesting. Everybody always talked, at least when I was in school, the, the talk was always, um, you know, viceroys mimic monarchs to take advantage of the fact that monarchs are poisonous. And that poison comes from the milkweed that they eat. We'll talk more about that later. But we have recently learned that viceroys themselves are poisonous, which is kind of interesting. So by mimicking each other, that actually increases their chance of success because instead of having to eat a monarch to realize that they don't taste good and make you sick, they can eat either a monarch or a viceroy and realize, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna do that again. All right, so what do monarchs eat? Monarchs eat milkweed. I, I love the fact that our grade schools are teaching this and, and when we do environmental ed programs, we see very frequently kids come in and they already know this already. But what you may not know is there are different types of milkweed. Here in Illinois, I've heard as many as 35 different species of milkweed are native here. And obviously we want to plant what's native to our region. Uh, there's a couple that we um, frequently see come up in landscaping though. So while there may be others out in the wild, um, the ones that are frequently found in landscaping include in the upper right, that's common milkweed. That's the stuff you normally see along the roadsides. It grows like six feet tall, sometimes taller than that. It's got those great big globe-shaped clusters of flowers in there that, by the way, they smell wonderful. It is like the most heavenly perfume. Definitely, if you see one of those in bloom, go just stick your face in it because it smells delightful. Love it, love it, love it. Looking very similar to common, but a little bit better behaved, if I'm being honest, um, and a little bit shorter, is our Sullivan's milkweed. That's on the lower left. So you can see it's got the big leaves like common milkweed does, but it doesn't spread quite as rapidly. Common milkweed, one of the problems with it is it spreads via rhizomes. I, I say problems. If you don't want it, it's a problem. Um, but it spreads via rhizomes, which means those little roots underground just pop up new plants. So if you plant one, next year you might have three, and the year after that you might have seven, and so on and so forth, until you have a huge patch of it which if that's not what you're looking for, can be kind of an issue. Sullivan's milkweed, on the other hand, doesn't spread quite so readily. So it's not quite so aggressive. Uh, next to that is swamp milkweed. That's the one with the purple flowers and the more lance-shaped leaves there. 
Um, swamp milkweed, despite its name, can grow in a wide variety of moisture conditions. So that's a great plant to have in your landscaping. I usually say that one grows to be about hip high, so not quite as tall as our common milkweed. Again, a little bit better behaved plant for a home landscape. Um, in the center there, or the center right, let's say, um, that's green milkweed, a little less common, uh, a little bit harder to find in the landscaping trade, but still a very cool one. And I just, I love the flowers on it. That's why I always include it. And then of course, in the lower right, that is butterfly weed. One of the most common ones that we see in home landscaping, striking orange flowers. They're fabulous. I absolutely love butterfly weed. Um, it's not as preferred by monarchs as some of the other types, but they will definitely use it in a pinch. Um, all monarchs can eat any of these types of milkweed, but you know, just like people with food preferences, they all have their food preferences too. I tend to find more monarchs on common milkweed, more caterpillars on common. Maybe that's just because the leaves are bigger. I'm not really sure why, um, but they will use all of these different types. All right, so let's talk about their life cycle. So in the upper left there, you can see that's a female monarch laying an egg. So obviously we start with eggs. So egg gets laid on milkweed, always on milkweed. They won't lay eggs on anything else. So that's why if you wanna have them in your yard, you gotta plant milkweed. So you can see how tiny those eggs are. Look at the point of the pencil there, that little cream colored thing. I don't know if you can see, uh, you can see my pointer there. That's that egg right there. They're teeny tiny. They're kind of football shaped as you can see there in the lower right. And that egg right there is about ready to hatch. And you can tell because that black spot at the tip, that's gonna be the head. And so when that dark spot starts to develop, you know he's coming out pretty soon. So you can see just how teeny, teeny tiny those eggs are. So when they hatch, they are, about a third the size of a grain of rice, okay? Which is really just crazy. They are teeny, teeny, tiny. Um, I find it harder to spot the newborns than to spot the eggs. To me, the eggs are even easier to see than the newborns. So once they hatch out of that egg, they actually turn around and eat the eggshell. That's their first meal is their eggshell. And I just love the way their head just looks comically large for their bodies too. Just like, you know, some babies, their heads are just gigantic compared to uh, the rest of their body there. But pretty soon they grow into it and you can see there. So now I mentioned instars earlier and you can see there, um, the first instar, that means the, new, the, the newborns basically. And then every time they shed their skin, then they go into the next instar, the next phase. So they go from first instar, second instar is a little bit bigger. They start to get their stripes a little bit more. Um, third instar, again, bigger still. You can start to see they got those little nubs of their false antenna in the back. All the way up until when they finally get to that fifth instar stage, they're really big. Um, both sets of antenna, the real antenna and the false antenna, um, you know, just all ready to go. And that one is about ready to make their chrysalis. All right, so how does a chrysalis happen? And th big thank you to uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife here for this video, because this is a really cool video. I find that um, most people don't really know how a chrysalis happens. So we're gonna watch a really quick video here to actually watch this chrysalis being made.
Okay. So hopefully you're able to see and hear that okay. Um, it was just music if you couldn't hear it, it's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, so that chrysalis is really interesting because most people think, oh, it, it makes it somehow, it spins a cocoon. First of all, butterflies make chrysalis, moths make cocoons. That's the big, uh, the big difference there. So in this chrysalis, it actually exists underneath the butterflies or the caterpillar's skin, which just blew my mind the first time I saw it. it. I think that's just absolutely amazing how that happens. And then you look at what the chrysalis looks like and you see those gold dots on there. I mean, it looks like it's been painted by an artist and that's just how they're made. So those gold dots on there, they have recently discovered that those correspond to spiracles or the breathing holes essentially in, for insects. So that's how they do gas exchange. They get oxygen in because, you know, they still need to exchange oxygen just like any other living thing. Um, but so they're in that chrysalis then. Um, I didn't talk about timelines, but they, they're in the egg for about three days. Then they're a caterpillar for about two weeks going through those different instar stages. And then they go into the chrysalis and they're in the chrysalis for about two weeks, about 10 to 14 days inside that chrysalis. And it should stay that very opaque green color all the way up until it's just about ready to eclose. That's the term for when the butterfly comes out of the chrysalis is eclose. So right before it's gonna eclose, that chrysalis is going to turn clear. And you see in that image there, how you can see the wing folded up inside there. It's like some kind of weird origami. And it's just, it's folded up in there. Then all of a sudden there'll be a little crack in that chrysalis and the butterfly is gonna come out. And when it comes out, the wings are gonna be folded and wet and they're gonna hang upside down, let gravity help them, pump blood into those wings, fill them out, dry them off. And it's gonna take them a couple hours really to, to be ready to fly. So once they're ready to fly, you'll, you'll see them, they'll start pumping their wings a little bit and then they'll fly off. And then usually they find a tree or somewhere where they can you know, hang out for a little bit and sort of finish getting themselves sorted and then they're ready to go. And then they stay an adult for about two weeks as well. And so you can see there in my hand, I've got a nice male. And we'll talk in a minute here about how you can tell the difference between them. All right, here we go. So male versus female. The easiest way to tell is if you can see them, if you can catch a glimpse when the wings are open. You see those black dots on the lower wings there. Those are um, like scent glands that the male uses to attract the female. So it's where pheromones, something like that. So that's how you can tell instantly that it's a male is if you see those black dots, it's a male. On the female, the, uh, the black lines on the wings tend to be a little bit thicker as well, but that's not something that at a glance, you're really gonna be able to tell until you've looked at a lot of them. Um, it, it's hard to know, oh, is that thick or is that a thin one? I don't know, look for the black dots. It's, that's by far the easiest way to tell. All right, so one of the things that makes monarchs so amazing is this migration. So we mentioned that they live as adults for about two weeks. That's the average generation. So there are in a given year, I believe five generations. And the last one is what they call the super generation. And the super generation, once they become the adult, they come out of the chrysalis, they become an adult, and then it's sort of like their development just freezes. I usually say it's like, it's like if you were to turn 16 and all of a sudden you just don't age anymore. That's what happens to them because then that generation and only that generation will start the journey down to Mexico. They will fly from all over the United States and Canada and fly down, you can see there's a small population that goes down to Florida. There's actually a population that stays in Florida. 
uh, year round, as well as populations in Canada that, or not Canada, California, that stay there year round. The rest of them fly down to Mexico, just outside of Mexico City. Um, there is a stand of Oyamel trees, which is a type of evergreen, and they will, first off, they will make it all the way down there. And they will live in those Oyamel trees for about three months or so. Um, come about March, they will start to head out again. And then once they reach Texas, it's like their development sort of kicks on again. And they reach Texas, they will reproduce, lay their eggs, and the adults will die. Those were the ones that went down. So they actually lived several months as opposed to just the two weeks that a normal monarch would live. So they lay their eggs, they die, those eggs turn into caterpillars, grow up, become butterflies, continue the journey. And here in Illinois, it's then about two generations later that they will finally make it here. And then they will go through their reproduction here. We'll have a couple generations here. And then that super generation turns around and heads back. There we go. So now you can see the return trip then that they take very similar. Um, to the path they took down. But if you catch the migration, it's the weirdest thing. So even here in Illinois, um, I was doing an outdoor ed program a couple years ago, and we were in a big, at a school, at a big field, and we were doing some insect program there, just happened to be. And it was like every 30 seconds or so, a monarch would go flying over heading south. And after about the fifth or sixth one, it finally dawned on me that this was migration, that we happened to be in a migration route. And it was just one after the other flying um, overhead. It was really, really cool to see. It's the only time I've seen anything like that before. It was really neat. So while they're down in Mexico, take a look at the trees there. You see where you see those kind of brownish trees that are dying off there? you know, looks like, oh, that forest is really sick. Well, those aren't the trees. Those are actually thousands and thousands, millions probably of butterflies hanging out in the trees there that from an aerial glance makes it look like the trees are dead, but it's just all the butterflies that are down there. It's amazing. That is a bucket list thing for me, by the way. All right. And milkweed, back here in our own backyards again. Milkweed is a community. There are lots of different things that will use milkweed as a host, right? There's milkweed beetles, you see. And it's interesting because a lot of the things that use milkweed as a host plant are orange and black, those kind of warning colors that things put out there. Um, you can see there on the left, that's a clear wing or a hummingbird moth. Found that on my milkweed and they are so big, they they really earn their name of hummingbird because they're about the size of a hummingbird, but they're actually a moth. Um, those candy striped leaf hoppers, I just love those little guys. They're so pretty. And then uh, milkweed tussock moth, I believe that's what those eggs are. Um, I'm, I'm fairly certain that's what they are. You, you'll see eggs for things on milkweed frequently. Uh, one way to know those are not monarchs, monarchs only lay single eggs. They don't lay them in a big cluster like that. You might see two at most, maybe three eggs on one leaf. Rarely will you ever see any more than that and definitely not in a cluster like this. So milkweed tussock moths are, um, it, you know, like many of the others, they are a, a fuzzy caterpillar. Um, so it's generally a warning not to touch them, but they will absolutely skeletonize a milkweed plant. I've got some out on mine now. Unfortunately, I've got plenty of milkweed I'll give them some, um, but they will just demolish a plant in short order because you see all the eggs there. If all those eggs turn into one caterpillar and they all start going after the leaves, it's, um, they, they really do a number on the plants. All right, so I am gonna talk a little bit about raising monarchs here. There are some people who do not agree with this and that's okay. There was a study that came out of University of Chicago a few years ago that claimed that monarchs that were raised indoors were not able to orient south and therefore could not migrate. This study has since been debunked, okay? The way the study was done has been widely criticized. The methods were not good. 
and the results were really not accurate, at least not for how most of us who do raise them, what we do. Um, they were bought from a farm. They were raised in uh, other kinds of conditions. And then they were really given a very limited time to orient. And that's what they used to determine that they were not orienting. Subsequent studies have shown that while it may take them you know, a couple minutes to orient themselves, they do. And given the number, we're gonna talk about citizen science in a moment, but given the number of tagged monarchs that make it down to Mexico, obviously they're able to orient themselves somehow because they make it all the way down to Mexico. So that said, those of us who are raising them, we're not going to save the population. No matter how many we bring inside, we are not going to make any headway in increasing the populations this way. It's a fun, educational uh, way to connect with nature and to get your neighbors and friends to connect with nature. I can't tell you how many people I have shown these caterpillars to and they are just enthralled. And, and it really, it gives them some encouragement then to go home and plant milkweed in their yard because ultimately that's what's going to help the populations is providing them with more food. So as an educational tool, I think it is absolutely valuable to do that. Um, are there irresponsible ways of raising monarchs? Absolutely, just like there are irresponsible ways of raising dogs. But done properly, done appropriately, I think it is a wonderful educational tool. And there are plenty of opportunities out there to become educated and to learn how to do it properly. My success rate is close to 100%. Um, in a given year. Um, in the wild, maybe one in 10 makes it to adulthood. So, you know, it, it's a way to, again, feel good about it, to connect yourself to nature, and to really feel like you're making a difference. Um, so there are Facebook groups like that beautiful monarch group down there, wonderful resources, that will help walk you through how to do it. Many people will use those pop-up hampers that you see there um, that helps to keep out any of the predators. As I mentioned, there are lots of predators for monarchs out there just besides birds. There's something called a tachinid fly or a chalcid fly. Um, both of those predate the caterpillars, or parasitize the caterpillars. Um, lots of, of issues that they can have. So having a mesh hamper like that can help to keep some of those predators out. And you can see me there in the middle. My husband thought he was funny taking a picture of me checking my milkweed plants, looking for eggs, getting food to feed my little caterpillars there. So anyway. All right. So I mentioned citizen science. Monarch Watch is one of the premier organizations that's out there. It's, um, I think, associated with the University of Kansas, I think, um, one of the universities in Kansas. Um, but they are the ones doing a lot of citizen science around studying monarchs, looking at population numbers, studying the Mexican population numbers, um, helping to protect the habitat in Mexico. And one of the ways they do that is by tagging. So if you raise monarchs or you can wild catch them too, I guess, and do this, um, you apply this little tiny tag to them that has a unique number on it. If that butterfly is then found somewhere, in whether in Mexico or along the migration route, people can then log that number and they can track and see where it was released versus where it was found. And this is, as I mentioned, this is one of the ways we know that tag butterflies do make it down to Mexico. So those that are being raised indoors they are actually making it down there. So um, just to add a little um, validity to that. Um, and then the Field Museum here in Chicago is also doing community science project. If you live here in the Chicago region, um, surrounding suburbs, then um, you can be a part of their community science project. They're monitoring uh, milkweed patches. And so not collecting or anything like that, just you're assigned a patch and you go out and you count eggs, you count caterpillars, 
and just report back to them. So it's, um, it's a cool thing to do in the summer, especially with kids. It's a great way to get kids excited about science and, and learning about things like that. So let's talk about how to get to yard. Just like anything else, you gotta give them what they want. And any animal is looking for food, water, and shelter. Same way to get rid of animals from your yard is you remove what they're coming to get. So in this case, we wanna bring them to our yard. So we want to provide them with their food, their water, and their shelter. We've already talked about their food, right? They need to have host plants. That's the plants that the caterpillars are gonna eat. So in the case of monarchs, that's gonna be milkweed. Different types of butterflies have different host plants. So if you wanna bring um, pearl crescent butterflies to your yard, you have to plant asters because that's what their host plants are. Uh, spice bush swallowtail, as the name implies, likes spice bush. So again, knowing what the host plants are of different butterflies in your region, you can then plant those things to help encourage them to your yard. So that's for the caterpillars. That's what the caterpillars are gonna eat, but the adults need to eat too. And so in those cases, we need nectaring plants. We need flowering plants that are gonna provide nectar for the butterflies to eat, the adults. So in the case of a lot of the um, non-native things that we like to put in our yard, like hostas and things like that, they really don't provide a whole lot of nectar. So knowing what plants are native to your region is really important because you plant those and that's what our native pollinators are going to use. So having the right milkweed species here, having the right species of asters or shrubs or trees, whatever it may be, um, having those is really, really important. So um, insects are much less specific on nectaring plants. There's a wide range of things that they'll feed off of. It's those host plants that tend to be very, very particular about. Other things, if you're going to have a butterfly garden in your yard, having dark colored rocks provides them a place to warm up in the morning, right? Especially in the early spring when the mornings are still kind of cool, gives them a place because they're not warm blooded like we are, they gives them a place to go and sit and, and take in that, that solar radiation um, that the, uh, the rocks are giving off that, that heat energy, um, as well as a sunny spot. A, the sunny spot is going to be where the majority of your flowers are, but again, also a, a place for them to go and stay warm. Um, also having a, a source of water for them is good. So you don't want it to be too deep because you don't want them to drown in there. Um, so what a lot of people will do is they'll put um, marbles or small rocks. If you put sand in there, that actually will leach out some minerals and some salts and things that they actually need. It's like giving them a vitamin. So having sand in there is a good idea too. So nice shallow dish of water. Obviously, you're going to want to change it out, make sure or let it dry out or whatever so that you're not encouraging mosquitoes. But that provides them a source of water as well. And then also some shelter. So shel they're going to shelter under things with larger leaves. So trees, shrubs, gives them a place to hide from predators as well as spend the night, um, gives them just some cover so that they're not out in the open. And we're not saying that you have to go put in a whole brand new flower bed in your yard. You can actually just swap out some natives for whatever you happen to have in there now, whether it's hostas, uh, non-native roses, whatever. And native plants are not weeds. So many people think native plants mean they're weeds. Most of the things that you're thinking of as weeds are generally not native. So if you take a look here, I mean, all of these are gorgeous flowers. I have most of these in my flower beds. I wish I could get cardinal flower to grow. I cannot. Um, but I have tons of Joe Pye weed. Joe Pye weed is a butterfly magnet. It has tons of pollen. Mine is just swarmed with native pollinators. They love it. Coreopsis is good. Same with the blazing star. Blazing star is another magnet for butterflies. They absolutely adore it. That cardinal flower that I mentioned, hummingbirds even will go use the cardinal flower. It's nice and bright red. They love it. And then I mentioned spice bush for those spice bush swallowtails and butterfly weed, which is a type of milkweed for our monarchs. 
So how do you get started? If you do nothing else, if you plant from these five genus here, Rudbeckia, Simplotrichum, Solidago, Asclepius, Quercus, those genus support 75% of all insect life here in our region. Anyway, if you're outside of our region, it may be a little bit different. Check with your local native plant society or wild ones chapter or something along those lines, and they can help you out with whatever is native to your region. But all of these different plants, there's lots of different members and they'll fit pretty much any yard. There is something from this list that will fit any yard. Goldenrods often get a bad rap. I had somebody just today say, oh, that causes my allergies. It does not. Goldenrod pollen is very big and it's sticky. It does not float very well in the air. That's not how goldenrods pollinate. Unfortunately, they bloom at the same time as ragweed. Ragweed does not have a very showy flower on it and often gets overlooked. But ragweed pollen is tiny, powdery, and floats very readily on the air. And yes, it makes me sneeze too. So ragweed is bad, goldenrod is fine. And asters, um, another nice thing about the aster family is they bloom late in the year. They're a fall blooming plant. They've not bloomed yet. So when those monarchs are getting ready to fly down to Mexico, they need a good ready food source, something they're, you know, they need fuel and asters help to provide that because they're one of the last things that are blooming in the area. So here at the Conservation Foundation, we have our conservation at home program. That's where we can come out and talk to you about adding native plants to your yard. We can make recommendations on native plants that you can use, or maybe your yard is already full of native plants and you've got a rain barrel and you're doing all kinds of great things already, in which case we can get you certified. You get a nice little sign for your yard and it tells your neighbors, hey, I know what I'm doing. If you are outside of the Kane, Kendall, DuPage, and Will County area, but you're still interested, we do have a few franchisees that are located in other areas like Lake County, McHenry County, Cook County. So if you're interested in any of those, drop me a line and I will help get you connected to the right person. Um, if we don't have somebody in your area, I'm very sorry, um, but you can check with your local land trust agency. Uh, and if you don't know who your local land trust is, there is a website, findalandtrust.org. And you can put your zip code in and they will tell you who your nearest land trust is. They will most likely be able to help you figure out which plants are native to your area. So a little joke here, what gives you butterflies every single time, no matter how many times you experience it? Buying caterpillars. Um, it's a joke, don't buy caterpillars. Um, they're very easy to find in our area. And if you are interested in raising them, definitely read up on it and, and learn to find them instead of buying them. Um, the, the areas that, or usually the, the places that sell them, raise them in large numbers. There's issues with inbreeding. It's, it's a whole bad thing. So um, definitely find them, raise them, release them. If you are interested in getting involved in other ways with the Conservation Foundation, you can become a member. As I mentioned, uh, the site you'll be taken to when we close out of this webinar, will have the information on that. You can also visit our McDonald Farm in Naperville or our Dixon Merced Farm in Montgomery. Uh, you can follow us on social media. You'll find out about all the wonderful things that we're doing as well as upcoming webinar information. And you can also get your yard certified. So like I said, drop me an email if you are interested in learning more about that program. Also, I haven't pushed this before, but I will now. Um, we have a merch store. So you can get that very cool Keep Calm and Plant Milkweed shirt, uh, as well as Nature Nerd shirts, cool hats, all kinds of great things. They make great gifts. And you can get the shirts at least in like 100 different colors. I'll show you mine in a second. And uh, yeah, so there you go. I will put that link in the chat as well. And with that, I will ask if anybody has any questions at this point. I just love that macro shot of the caterpillar's face 
I just think that's really cool. And then you can see, I think, I feel like it looks like a, a horror movie picture there. That was the lid of one of my containers one year when I had just so many chrysalis going. Um, that was a fun year. All right, so we will close out of here. I will stop sharing and there we go. So as, as promised, I will show you my shirt. This is my Keep Calm and Plant Milkweed shirt. My husband has one in charcoal and it's a joke in our house because every time we go out and he wears that shirt, he gets compliments on it. I wear my shirt, nobody says a word, but of course he wears his shirt and he gets you know 37 compliments. So anyway, with that, if anybody's got any questions, I would be happy to answer them now. Casey wants to know, do we have any idea what environmental or physiological triggers cause the super generation? Great, great question. Um, boy, if we do know what they are, I have not seen them. As with any migratory cues, I would imagine it has something to do with cooling temperatures, possibly changing um, the plant types that are changing, perhaps. Um, day length, you know, the shortening days, um, that could be as well. People say that the, I think it's the, the super generation tends to be smaller. So, it, you know, probably makes it easier for them to fly less energy requirements. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know that we completely know. We don't even know how they orient themselves, how they figure out where to go. Because if you think about it, the ones that are leaving here to go down to Mexico, they've never been there. Their parents, their grandparents have never even been there. Somehow they know where to go. And to me, that is absolutely fascinating. Like, how do they, like, if I just started walking, I would have no idea where I'm, I can't even figure out which way is south. So how they know where to go, how to get to this particular stand of trees outside Mexico City, it's, it's just amazing. And then when they turn around and come back, how do they know where they're coming back to? You know, it just, the whole thing is just absolutely, absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, Karen wants to know when the super generation gets back in the spring, how long do they live? Okay, so the super generation doesn't get back here. They leave Mexico and they get to about Texas and they lay their eggs in Texas. And then I, I don't know exactly, you know, maybe they live another week or so. Um, it's not very long because they're, they're quite honestly, they're pretty ratty by that point. Um, their, you know, their wings get very tattered. Um, so they, they don't live very long. They, they basically, they get to Texas, they lay their eggs and then they're going to die. And then it's like two more generations before they get back here all the way. So it's, yeah, it's, it's super interesting. Um, okay. So we have a question here that says my milkweed looks like it's dying, but I was told that means it's being eaten by the caterpillars, but I haven't seen any. Now there's a lot of green stuff at the base. Should I pot it in the ground now? Uh, so I, I, it depends on what the green stuff is. It's hard, hard for me to say, but if it looks like it's dying, so when caterpillars eat it, I mean, they eat it. So they're gonna eat it down to, you'll just see that main vein um, and they'll just devour it. So if it's, if it's turning yellow, if it's droopy, that's something else entirely. Um, interestingly enough, you can tell when there's a baby caterpillar around those first, like that first instar, because they'll eat in the shape of a letter C. I don't know why, um, but that, but they do. So they like, they can't eat the whole leaf. So they just end up eating in the shape of a C. Um, another really cool thing that I've actually seen them do is they will cut the veins close to that central main vein of the leaf. And the reason for that is milkweed is full of that milky sap, that real sticky stuff. And it, they can, it can gum them up if they get full of that and, and kill them. So by cutting that vein, they're actually cutting off the source of that sap so that they can safely eat the rest of the leaf. Again, so cool. How do they know to do that? Something else I didn't mention, 
was part of the reason they have to eat milkweed is because that's where they get the toxins to become toxic later on. If they don't eat the milkweed, they don't develop those toxins. So if you or I were to eat milkweed, it's got a cardiotoxin in it, which means it's going to go after your heart muscle and cause all kinds of heart problems. With them, instead of digesting it, those chemicals get stored in their fat, in their bodies. And then that stays there even from when they're in the chrysalis to becoming an adult. So they maintain all of that toxic stuff. And that's what makes them toxic as an adult. So um, just, again, super, super interesting stuff. Um, how do they do it? How, you know, how do their, how does their body manage to just incorporate that instead of digesting it? I don't know, but it's super cool. All right, any other questions from anybody else? If you have any other questions, like I said, go ahead and put them in the chat, put them in um, the Q&A box. Uh, let's see, oh, Sandy wants to know, how do monarchs find my tiny milkweed plants? They can somehow smell, I guess is the right word, milkweed, they can sense it. They, it and it's it's really funny because I've, I've seen, I don't know if it was a study, study, but um, they like plants that are in smaller patches or even single plants, um, as opposed to a giant solitary, you know, uh, patch of milkweed, which may have to do with the fact that there are more predators likely when there's a larger patch of milkweed. It's, it's likely that other predators have found that as well and know that, hey, if I want a snack, this is where I go. So they'll look for those and I've seen that at my own house. I have one solitary plant that just popped up on the side of my house and I let it go. It got egg bombed. I had like a dozen eggs on there. So how they've managed to find that, I don't know, but boy, do they ever. Um, Colleen wants to know the best source to learn how to raise them inside. There are some great books that are out there. Um, I'm struggling to remember the titles of them now, but there's a, there's a couple of, of good books that are out there. Um, there's a couple of really good Facebook groups, honestly. Um, that Beautiful Monarch Facebook group, if you're on Facebook, is a really great resource. They have files in the group that you can go look at that go through everything from how to set it up, potential problems that you might run into, um, how to grow your own milkweed, all that kind of stuff. Um, those are really great groups to learn from. And then when you have questions, you can ask. And there's, you know, lots of very helpful people in those groups. Um, and if you go to places like Monarch Watch, um, there are other Facebook, or not Facebook, there are websites that are, are run by let's say more scientifically minded groups that will talk about this as well. So um, Monarch Watch, as I said, is a really great one. That's got um, some good information in it as well. Um, but yeah, there's, there's lots of information out there that you can, uh, that you can read through. Um, Annette says, can you think of any reason why my mother-in-law's yard is full of common milkweed uh, monarchs, but not one egg? It's been four years now without one egg. Well, eggs, can be very difficult to find. Um, sometimes when, when the, there's flower buds, they'll lay the eggs on the flower buds. Those are almost impossible to see. Um, and unless you've been doing it a while, it can be hard to tell what's an egg and what is, for example, just a little bit of dried sap that's on there. So um, I'm, I'm not saying you missed them, but they can be very hard to see. Um, what else, what could cause it? Um, again, sometimes they just have preferences. Um, sometimes maybe they just haven't found it yet. Um, it, you know, or if you've got monarchs around there, I just I find it hard to believe that if you've got monarchs flying around that that they wouldn't be laying eggs there. Um, I don't know, but. And you know, even I have people say like, "Oh, there were four caterpillars yesterday, and now there's none." Sometimes they get picked off by birds. Sometimes they just crawl off 
you know, when they're, when they're shedding their skin, they like to kind of go off by themselves sort of in private. I jokingly say that, um, you know, that they want some privacy while they're changing their clothes. Um, and so sometimes they just will leave and go someplace else. So when they're outside, who knows where they went, you know, um, and when they go to make their chrysalis, they definitely go away. They, they go to find someplace very private, very quiet, very out of the way. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, Sharon says, what time of year should we look for eggs? Um, I usually start finding them in June, in early June, late May, around there, um, all the way until, um, I would, depends on your area, how late or, or you know, exactly when, um, and that kind of goes by latitude. So different latitudes, different weeks. Here in the Chicago region, um, I start finding them generally late May, early June, and then you'll find them all the way until mid to late August. Um, your mileage may vary depending on where you live. Uh, let's see, Carol wants to know, any idea what causes the brilliant gold specks in the chrysalis? Yeah, so that's something we've only recently figured out. They put a chrysalis in an MRI machine. Okay, and this totally blows me away too. So up until like within, the, I would say within the last five years, we had no idea what happened inside the chrysalis. We know they went into the chrysalis and a butterfly comes out. We had no idea what happened actually inside that chrysalis. Some scientists took one and put it in an MRI. And through that, they were able to figure out that once inside that chrysalis, the caterpillar's body turns into goo. It just turns into soup. Now, the heart and a few organs sort of stay intact. And those gold specks, I'm getting to the gold specks. The gold specks correlate to the spiracles, which in an insect, the spiracles are how they do gas exchange, how they breathe. So how they take in oxygen. And so those gold specks were found to correspond to spiracles. So they think that that's how they're exchanging gas. So taking in oxygen, releasing carbon dioxide. Um, everything else, it just goes to soup inside there. And out of that soup, somehow a butterfly is formed. It just blows me away. It's so, so cool. All right. Donna says, I got to see monarchs mate. Yeah, that's, that is, I don't think I've ever seen, I've seen pictures of it, but I haven't actually like seen it happening. And it can go on for hours, the male and the female couple. And like, they will stay coupled for like hours. And it almost looks like they're fighting. And sometimes they're down on the ground and it's, you know, obviously I imagine it would be hard. It's hard enough trying to say paddle a two-man kayak. I can't imagine trying to fly with two sets of wings there. So yeah, um, bad analogy probably. Anyway, so yeah, it's, it's crazy. It, yeah. And then the female will go on to lay tons of eggs from that. So um, I have a male, I'm fairly certain it's a male, it's behavior of a male, um, that actually patrols my milkweed patch. And he will just sort of fly circles around it and he will chase off anything that comes flying by. A bee, a wasp, another butterfly, a bird. I mean, he will chase off anything that is his patch and he is waiting for the girls. And yeah, so it's just, it's funny because he is out there every day, just flying around the one patch, just flitting around. He'll stop and eat at the Joe Pie weed for a little bit and then keep flying around. But this is like the second or third year I've seen him do it. It's super cool. Anyway, any other questions from anybody? All right. If not, not seeing any. I wanna thank you all for joining us for our very first evening conservation online video. Hope you all enjoyed it. We will be back next month, first Wednesday of the month, remember seven o'clock to do the reboot of our 
garden refresh. So you'll get to see updates. You'll get to see the um, pictures, see what it looks like now, kind of they'll do before and after. Um, it'll be great. So looking forward to that. So hope to see you all back next week. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Good night.